sorry that it's an interest. My dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath morning and thank you um, that we live in a country where um, we have the freedom to come and worship you as we see fit and as our conscience dictates. And uh, Lord, we just ask that uh, as uh, we go through the message this morning, Lord, I pray, uh, even as Austin has already prayed for me, that I, I speak not your, my own words, that I speak your words, and that um, anything that uh, might come from me uh, be suppressed, and uh, that your message be clear. Uh, just pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear the message you have for us today as well. Uh, please forgive us for our sins. If there's anything that stands between us and you, Lord, we need that, and we have a clear and uh, a wonderful experience with you this morning. We ask you to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the title for the message this morning is Fear God. Perhaps one of the most underappreciated verses of the scriptures, I think, is found in Genesis 1-1, as it starts, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I say that this may be one of the underappreciated verses of the Bible, because perhaps we don't sit to really contemplate what this actually means. Many of you uh, live in this area because you like the outdoors. And uh, I know a lot of you like to go hiking. One of the real pleasures of hiking is that um, sometimes the destination has an incredible vista. And uh, I don't know how many of you have had this experience where you look out over a mountain you see um, the valleys and the mountains uh, out below you, and you think how small we really are in the whole scheme of things. Some of these um, experiences can be truly spiritual experiences where you have an understanding and a recognition of an idea that there must be something more. I think that experience can be expanded, and for those of you who don't like hiking, you can have that same experience simply by turning our eyes to the sky. We can look and we can see the numerous stars in the night sky, and we realize that we are simply one person on a small planet a solar system of one star, the sun. And when we look out into the vast night sky and we see that each one of those tiny lights is a solar system, we start to get a sense of how small we truly are. When we look and we see that those stars form galaxies, and in this photo, each one of those lights don't represent stars, but entire galaxies. We realize, to a small degree, the greatness of God. You know, the Bible has some interesting uh, stories that would give us some insight into this as well. Many of you are familiar with the resurrection story where uh, after Christ's crucifixion, he was placed in the tomb and they set a watch of Roman soldiers. Matthew 28, 2-4 through four, tells us what happens, what, well, what happened when the attempt was to make sure no one stole his body. It says, and behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for the fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. This was one angel. 
the brightness of one angel caused an entire watch of Roman soldiers to quake and to fall down as dead men. Most of us are familiar with the Christmas story and the shepherds, how the angels lit up the sky in song. And, uh, and basically, the night time was like a day because of the brightness of the, of the, of the angels. It's interesting that if we read in the great controversy, it says, the abiding place of the king of kings, where a thousand thousands minister unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stand before him, that temple filled with the glory of the eternal throne, where seraphim, its shining guardians, fill their faces in adoration. As bright as a single angel or a legion of angels might be, it is suggested that they are no comparison to the brightness of the throne of God, where the Father sits. Revelation 21, 23 tells us, talking about the New Jerusalem, it says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. Why did it not need that? For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. It's describing a shining city that does not need any sun or any external light, because the city itself glows with the brightness that emanates from the throne of God. Amen. This should give us some idea as to the grandeur of the God that we serve. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The concept, the being that is God, the one that created the entire universe. Do we really ever sit down to think about that? What that means? In the grand scale of things. You know, this brightness, this shining, has another dimension to this. We're told in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed, and the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his heart. It's actually the presence of God that is worth it. For nothing that is sinful and nothing that is wicked can stand in the presence of such purity and such holiness. The title for the message this morning was Fear. God. What does that mean to fear? Most of us would take that word fear and we would think of being afraid, being scared. And that is obviously the most common definition for fear. But if you look in the dictionary, and uh, this term, fear God, comes from, uh, in the King James Version. Um, if you look at a different definition, in the archaic English, it means to regard God with reverence and awe. When you see that bright and shining throne room in the city, or when you see Christ returning in the sky, which kind of fear will you have? Get a better understanding of what it means to fear God. We want to turn to the scriptures, and it's interesting because that specific phrase, fear God, in the King James Version of the Bible only appears ten times. I'm actually surprised by that. That, that term, and uh, we're not going to go through all ten versions, all ten places where that's uh, that's mentioned, but we are going to go through a few to see if we can get perhaps a better understanding of what the scripture means 
when it exhorts us to fear God. The first one is found in Genesis chapter 42, in talking about the story of Joseph. As many of you are familiar with the story of Joseph, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was wrongfully accused and sent to prison for something that he did not do. But ultimately, God worked in his life to bring him out to be the second most powerful person in Egypt. Only second to the Pharaoh. And one day, his brothers, during a famine in the whole land, his brothers came to Egypt to, to purchase food for their families. And they didn't recognize him in that position. The last time they saw him was after they sold him as a slave. And when Joseph first saw them, he must have had a flood and a mix of emotions because he didn't seem to know what to do exactly. And he simply stated, spies! You're all spies. And he threw them into jail. Now, he didn't have any kind of justification for that. These men just showed up to purchase food and that was the accusation they were thrown into jail. But Joseph had some time to think about things. And on the third day, this is what he said to his brothers. He said, And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be down in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. This might seem like an unusual place to see this phrase. But when Joseph says, I fear God, what is he saying to his brothers? saying, I know that there's somebody above me, right, that's going to hold me accountable for my thing, my, for my actions. So I'm going to try to be as fair as I can be. Would that be kind of a fair, a fair, uh, uh, a fair explanation of what he is actually saying there? Would you agree? So on the one hand, you realize that to say you fear God means that you recognize that there's a power above. Right? The next place that we see this is in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. And here, this is actually the story of the Exodus where Moses is taking the Israelites out into the wilderness. And he's the leader and all the people keep coming to him with all their problems to judge and uh, to be a judge among, uh, among all their issues. <coughs> and, um, and his, and his father-in-law notices this and he says, oh, you are taking on too much for yourself. You really need some help. And this is the advice that he gives to them. He says, moreover, thou shalt provide out of all people able men, such as fear God, Men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Here, the phrase fear God is being used to describe the type of people that are fit to be judges. Right? To be a judge is saying, is it only enough to recognize that there's somebody above you, somebody higher that will hold you accountable. No. Their life must reflect that knowledge. Would you agree? It says, men of truth hating covetousness. So not only do they now express the knowledge that there must be someone above for whom they hold account, or to whom they hold account, but they also have, have some demonstration of that reality in their life. We'll go to the next story. In Job, chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. We all know the story of Job. We know that Satan was having a debate with God, and Job ended up being the, uh, the battleground. <laughs> so, um, 
when Satan comes to, to God in that, in that story, he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God or not? In other words, does he, is there no reason why Job fears God? Isn't there a reason why Job fears God? So what Satan is saying of Job himself, he's saying, Job fears God, but, but why? Okay. And in describing Job, God says that he is a perfect and upright man, somebody who fears God. Steers us up away. This term, fear God, is also found in Psalms. Psalm 66, 16 says, Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I'll, uh, just a couple more examples here. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 to 12, it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. What is Solomon saying here? He's saying that God is the ultimate judge. Right? And those who live in the fear of God, recognizing that God is the ruler, recognizing that he is the judge, he knows that at the end, God will justify the righteous. And that there is a judgment coming for us. You also see this in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 41, it says, this, this is the story of the crucifixion where Christ is crucified. And there are two sinners crucified, one on each side. And this is what it says. And one of the malefactors which were hanged rail, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. So on the one side, there's a, there's a criminal who's also crucified with Christ, and he is... He's basically goading Christ. He's saying, if you really are the Christ, why don't you save us? Right? You can save yourself, you can save us too. But the, but the other says to him, the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? <coughs> Seeing thou art in some in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Why is the criminal asking, Doth thou not fear God? Why is he asking that? He's asking, Don't you realize that there is a God? That we are on the verge of meeting. We are on the verge of judgment. I mean, we are about to be in the place of judgment. The final accounting with God. And we, but rightfully so, because we've done wrong. But Christ has done nothing wrong. And then this is followed by his famous appeal to Christ. Remember me. Come into your community. It's important for us to understand what it means to fear. What does it mean to fear God? Is it to be afraid for the judgment that is coming? Or is it to stand in awe? 
it's especially important for us to understand this because the first angel of the three angels' message, message is, I should say, exhorts the world to fear God. Revelation 14, 6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and fountains of waters. One of the last messages to the world that is given is to fear God. How should we interpret this? How should we share this? Is it to warn people and to tell them to fear because they are going to suffer the wrath of a vengeful God? It could be. Or is it to appeal to the world to stand in awe of the fact that there is a God, a creator God, You know, I had a hard time actually preparing for the message this week. This week was just kind of a long week. Um, and I really appreciated actually some passages that I read in the entire ages. So, to kind of uh, conclude the message this morning, there are several long passages that I would like to share with you in the first chapter of the entire ages. And if you've never read it, I encourage you to read it. If you um, have read it before, but don't remember, uh, it's a great reading for, for this afternoon. So I'm going to just start with Desire of Ages, um, page 20, paragraph 2. It says, Even now, all created things declare the glory of his excellence. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. What, got, what, what is being written here is saying that everyone has been created. Not just people, but all of creation, all of the living creation has been created with a purpose. And that purpose involves service to each other. It says, there is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but it has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of the tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in the showers to water the earth, that it may bring forth and flood. If we look upon nature, we realize that this is true. When we see the bees pollinating the flowers, and yet at the same time obtaining the sweet nectar, when we see, we see a glimpse of what the original creation was meant. Obviously, our world has been corrupted by sin. And we see elements of the sinful principle in action as well. The principle of the survival of the fittest. It's a real principle, it definitely exists. Probably not part of the original creation. In the Tower of Ages, it continues and goes on. It says, the angels of glory find their joy in giving giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into a fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves know. We've spoken about this in the past. We've spoken about how God originally created, the scriptures say that God created the man a little lower than the angels. And yet God has prepared a plan for humanity that is beyond imagination as to what the purpose he had, as to the 
purpose for humanity. And the angels minister to us, working with God and working with humanity, to try to bring souls to a point of salvation. Recognizing that human beings have a special privilege that even they may not be able to experience. And yet they selflessly work on our behalf. The Zion of Ages continues. But turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of the Him that sent me. What she's saying is, is that, yeah, we see these examples in nature. We see the birds, we see, uh, you know, we see the flowers, we see all of creation originally designed to serve each other. But the greatest example is that one of Christ. And the example that she gives is actually quite stunning. It says this. In these words is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life. This is actually the law. What is that law? It says, all things Christ received from God, but he took to give. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son, it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love to the great source of all. And thus, through Christ, the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great hero, the awe of life. Isn't that an interesting idea? That all life flows out from God, and that that life returns to God a blessing through praise and worship. That we actually exist to serve God. It's an awesome thought if you think about it. You really can sit and contemplate that idea. And yet, this idea has also been perverted. It says, in heaven itself, this law was broken. Sin originated in self-seeking loosens. The covering cherub, desire to be first in heaven. He sought to gain control of heavenly beings, to draw them away from their creator, and to win their homage to himself. Therefore, he misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. With his own evil characteristics, he sought to invest the loving creator. Thus he deceived the angels. Thus he deceived men. He led them to doubt the word of God and to distrust his goodness. And I think this next part is very important. It says, because God is a God of justice and terrible majesty. That word there, terrible, means really awesome majesty. Satan caused them to look upon him as severe and unforgiving. Thus he drew men to join in, in rebellion against God, and the night of woe settled down. See, fear God, the term fear God, can mean both. If you live your life without the fear of God, there will be a time when you will be afraid. If you live your life in a way in which you do fear God, there will be a time when you can stand simply in awe of this great God that we serve. There is actually, we've discussed this before, but God offers us to something that is actually quite unique. And we can find this in this thought in Exodus. When ex in Exodus, there's a story of Moses where God spent time with Moses on the Mount of Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. At the end of those 40 days and 40 nights, 
God gave to him the Ten Commandments. We all kind of know this story. As he was going down from the mount, he, he saw the Israelites basically so recently having seen the glory of God. They had turned and back into idolatry. And in righteous indignation, those, three of those Ten Commandments down and drove them. What's interesting is, is that God told Moses after that to cut two tables of stone. And that Moses was to bring that, those stones up to the mountain for him to recreate the first tables of stone. You know, it's actually a really beautiful idea that is being uh, demonstrated here. See, God created humanity represented in those stones. Within the hearts of men, in the original creation, he had written the law of God, the law of life. <coughs> but when man decided that he, he wanted to be his own God, he wanted to determine for himself what was right and wrong. That original picture, those tables of stone that had the written law of God broken and shattered on them. You know, it's interesting that God doesn't say, why don't you just uh, come back and I'll write you another one. He doesn't say that. Actually, he said, why don't you go cut your own tables of stone out and bring them up to the mountain. I will again write my law into those things. He's giving a symbol of what it means to be redeemed. He's saying, bring yourself up to God. Because obviously these stones are not from heaven. These are from the earth. There's no way that these stones were perfect. I suspect the ones that God gave to us originally were. But he's saying, bring them up to me, and I will recreate my law in your heart. Isn't that an interesting idea? So Moses does this. He takes us up to the mountain, and he says, and as he's there, Moses has this burning desire. And he says in verse 18, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And what does the Lord say? I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. See, in the human mind, we think that the glory is in the awesomeness of his physical expression. You know, we see, if we were to see a light so shining brightly, that we, we would be consumed in its presence. We think that that is the awesome power and glory of God. But God says, I will make all my goodness pass me. The glory of God is actually His goodness, His character. And He says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You know, it's interesting. So uh, Exodus continues with the story. It says, And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into the Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is the glory of God. When you fear God and stand in His presence in awe, this is the character of God that you appreciate. But sometimes we forget the second part, and that will by no means clear the guilty. If you don't accept what you have set up for you, then there is another part of God's awesomeness. 
is justice. It says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. You know, what's really amazing is, is that God is such a good God and He is such a loving God and it tells us something about Moses that changed after this experience. In Exodus 34, verses 34 to 35, it says, But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face showed. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in. When you fear God, when you stand in awe in His presence, the glory of God becomes imparted to you. Amen. You can see here that Moses reflected, not just in a character sense, but in an actual physical sense. His face shined with the glory Remnant from his experience with God. This is what gives us some of the thoughts about how the righteous will shine. There's a more explicit place where that's stated. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall what? Shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I don't think he's talking about shining like a little dot in the sky. He's talking about shining like a star, truly with the brightness of the star. And this is the greatness of God, that he is willing to impart and to share his glory with us. One more statement of the Desire of Ages. It's a long one. It says, By his life and death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from ruin, not through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ we became more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. See, only God would do that. This is actually the expression of God. You know, a human being, when somebody fails you, you just, you're considered to be good if you just bring them to a level where they were before, right? If somebody, you know, if somebody fails in life and they struggle and they're on the streets and everything else, we think it's an amazing thing when we bring them back to be a, a, a righteous member of society. But this is more of the equivalent of taking that person who has who has made very many mistakes in their life, and actually placing them, putting them in a position of leadership, you know, a position of power. It says, in taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, he gave him to the fallen race. To assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one of the human family, forever to retain his human nature. This is the pledge that God will fulfill his word. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. We've explored this subject before. God became a man. A first kind of being to exist. A representative of who he wants us to be. Not that he has a beginning or an end, but simply that he is showing a new example of that's how I was about to end, so I am going to have to finish up here. It says, God has adopted human nature in the person of his Son and has carried the same into the highest heaven. 
It is the Son of Man who shares the throne of the universe. It is the Son of Man whose name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The I Am is the daysman between God and humanity, laying his hand upon both. <coughs> he who is holy, harmless, and undefiled, separate from sinners, is not ashamed to call us brethren. In Christ, the family of the earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ glorified is our brother. <coughs> heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. The work of redemption will be complete. In the place where sin abounded, God's grace so much more abounds. The earth itself very field that Satan claims as his is to be not only ransomed but exalted. Our little world, under the curse of a sin, a sin, the one dark blot in this glorious creation, will be honored above all the worlds in the universe of God. Here, where the Son of God tabernacled in humanity, where the King of God, or King of glory, lived and suffered and died, here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with them, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And through endless ages, as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift. Amen. Emmanuel. Will you accept that covenant relationship? Will you fear God and live a life in which God is God? God is your God, both creator and redeemer. Will you accept and stand in awe of his glory and in his presence? Will you accept my dear Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive me for my clumsy speech, and forgive me for um, I misrepresented you in any way this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are truly an awesome God, a God that created not just this earth, not just this solar system, but the entire universe. And that you have condescended to stoop down in the form of a man, to live with us, and to share with us who God truly is. And as we come to a better understanding of who you are, I pray that you would bless us more and more with your presence, that we may reflect who you are to others, that we may live a life that is a reflection of the glory that you have, the glory of your character. And we thank you for a truly merciful, a truly loving, a truly good you are in offering to us such an incredible future. We pray for your blessing today on each and every individual today as we part. Uh, may we continue to revel in the blessing of your Sabbath and rest. And, um, and may your Holy Spirit continue to walk with us. For I ask and pray this in Jesus.